the English East India Company, EIC, later known as the British East India Company, was established in 1600 as a trading entity. Backed by a formidable private army and the support of the British government, the EIC engaged in the exploitation of the Indian subcontinent from 1757 until mounting disorder led to government intervention, resulting in the transfer of EIC possessions to British rule in 1858. This company was instrumental in executing Britain's imperialistic ambitions in Asia. It generated substantial profits by engaging in global trade of spices, tea, textiles, and opium. However, it faced criticism due to its monopolistic practices, unfair trading conditions, corrupt conduct, and the harm it inflicted upon the wool industry. Most significantly, the EIC displaced rulers, extracted resources relentlessly, and suppressed the cultural heritage of the inhabitants residing within its vast dominions. The EIC essentially served as the sharp edge of British imperialism, fought, six, the EIC's directors and shareholders amassed immense wealth, while India grew progressively poorer. Beyond a mere trading enterprise, the EIC transformed into a quasi-state, effectively an empire within an empire, accountable solely to its shareholders. The EIC originated through a royal charter granted on December 31, 1600, forming a limited joint stock company led by a group of 215 investors and merchants under the Earl of Cumberland's leadership bestowed by Queen Elizabeth I of England, r. 1558 to 1603, the charter bestowed upon the EIC exclusive trading rights with India, effectively granting a monopoly over all commerce east of the Cape of Good Hope. The EIC was even authorized to wage war to conduct its trade, although lacking sovereignty in its areas of operation, the EIC could exert sovereignty on behalf of the English Crown and government. Sir Thomas Rowe, 1581 to 1644, dispatched by King James I of England, r. 1603 to 1625, to the Mughal Emperor Jahangir's court, built upon earlier contacts initiated by trader William Hawkins in 1609. Between 1612 and 1619, Rowe secured permission for the EIC to establish a trading post or factory in Surat on India's west coast. The British eventually took full control of the port in 1759, though Bombay, Mumbai, became the EIC's primary trading hub after England acquired it from Portugal in 1661. The EIC further expanded its reach by establishing trading posts in locations such as Masulipatam, Madras, Huli, and Calcutta. Autonomy was granted to the EIC by Charles II of England, r. 1660-1685, to counter Dutch interests in Asia, represented by the Dutch East India Company, VOC. The VOC, founded shortly after the EIC, wielded a powerful naval fleet and had seized valuable Portuguese empire territories. As the VOC's grip on the spice trade tightened, the EIC's focus shifted to India. Engaging in what was termed the triangular trade, the EIC exchanged precious metals for Indian-made products, particularly fine textiles, which were then traded in the East Indies for spices. These spices, notably pepper, were subsequently transported to London, commanding high prices that yielded profits on the initial investment in metals. The EIC also profited immensely from controlling the salt and tea trades, as well as from the sale of opium to China. The extensive importation of tea to Britain led to it becoming more affordable than locally brewed beer, supported by inexpensive sugar imports from Caribbean slave plantations. This facilitated the rise of tea consumption in Britain and its American colonies, ultimately sparking the Boston Tea Party and subsequent revolution. The EIC acquired tea by trading Indian opium, which it smuggled into China, leading to the First Opium War in 1839. The EIC was involved in trading various commodities, including porcelain, silk, saltpeter for gunpowder, indigo, coffee, silver, and wool. The company's well-armed ships, known as East Indiamen, played a pivotal role in transporting goods worldwide, armed with around 30 to 36 cannons. The EIC's dominance sparked concerns in Britain over draining its economy of silver and the detrimental impact on the wool trade due to massive imports of Indian textiles. Measures were introduced, such as increased duties on cotton imports and laws favoring wool. The company's monopoly was challenged, leading to a ban on finished cotton cloth imports to Britain. However, this also fueled the growth of a domestic textile industry, contributing to the Industrial Revolution. 
the EX trade monopoly faced criticism for being detrimental to the nation's interests. The company's extensive territories generated income through rents and forceful measures, the EIC wielded significant influence, fostering both admirers and critics, its extensive trade operations helped shape global metropolises like Mumbai, Singapore, and Guangzhou, while creating new export markets for British and other goods. Nevertheless, its contracts favoured the EIC itself rather than benefiting others, with substantial power, the EIC drew criticism for siphoning silver from Britain's economy and undermining the domestic wool industry. The EIC's colossal influence gave rise to adversaries, yet it generally attracted more criticism than support. The relationship between the British East India Company EIC, and the Mughal Empire held mutual benefits. British warships provided maritime services and safeguarded the empire's interests at sea. However, the emergence of the Marathas in the 18th century challenged the British Mughal Association as they seized Mughal territories in southern and western India. As of 1757, the EIC assumed control of its own territories, effectively becoming an autonomous entity within a larger state. The EIC made substantial investments in building professional military forces and utilized British Army regular regiments through payment. Its military strength in Bengal surged from 6,680 troops in 1763 to 129,473 in 1823. A significant portion of troops were drawn from the Indian peasantry. This vast army overshadowed the company's civilian workforce, which numbered around 3,500 by 1830. The EIC established fortifications, operated its navy, the Bombay Marine, coined currency, maintained an extensive archive, now held in the British Library, conducted legal proceedings, and operated prisons for those who transgressed against it. The company even sponsored extensive survey missions. To staff its ranks, the EIC implemented entry exams and drew staff exclusively from Britain. The Court of Proprietors, consisting of investors, represented diverse backgrounds including nobles, politicians, military personnel, merchants, professionals, and small investors, forming a wide-ranging support base for the EIC. The EIC's authority extended through periods of both prosperity and decline. External factors such as wars, trade restrictions, corruption, smuggling, and piracy influenced its trajectory. European rivals vied to exploit India's trade and resources, and the French East India Company posed a formidable challenge. While Madras changed hands between British and French control, a second English East India Company emerged in 1698, only to merge with the original in 1709. After the Battle of Bukhar in 1764 to 5, the Mughal Emperor granted the EIC the authority to collect land revenue in Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. This significant development empowered the EIC to protect its interests and expand its reach. The company evolved into the official tool of the British Empire in India, distinguished by its coordinated centers of operation. The EIC underwent reforms under Robert Clive, who transformed private trade into a more regulated form of British government control. The company's administration expanded alongside its military conquests, yet allegations of corruption persisted. The EIC's involvement in promoting Christianity remained limited due to fears of repeating mistakes made by the Portuguese Empire. This served as a reminder that the company remained a trading entity, not a sovereign state. The British government began exerting control through legislative acts, such as the Regulating Act and India Act of 1773 and 1774, eventually leading to increased oversight, transparency, and the cessation of private trade by EIC officials. The British government's elevated interest in India can be traced to the loss of its North American colonies in 1783. By the early 19th century, around 100 members of parliament in Westminster were EIC employees, reflecting the company's deep political influence in Britain. Key figures like Lord William Bentinck emphasized treaties over military campaigns to drive expansion, accompanied by social reforms. However, these reforms were perceived differently in India, seen as part of Anglicization and Christianization. Subsequent Charter Acts in 1833 and 1853 diminished the EIC's authority, especially its monopoly on trade with China. Lord Marquess of Dalhousie's tenure saw significant territorial expansion, notably through the Anglo-Sikh Wars, but this expansionist policy led to backlash. 
The collapse of the Mughal Empire and the Sepoy Mutiny in 1857-58 marked the end of the Eix rule and the formal shift of authority to the British crown. Despite the initial success of the mutiny, the superior resources of the Eix and the British government ensured its suppression. In 1858, the British crown assumed full control over Eix territories, marking the beginning of the British Raj. In 1874, Parliament dissolved the Eix, and Queen Victoria's proclamation as Empress of India in 1877 further solidified British rule. British control persisted until India gained independence in 1947. In 1874, Parliament dissolved the Eic, and Queen Victoria's proclamation as Empress of India in 1877 further solidified British rule. British control persisted until India gained independence in 1947.